Okay, so uh, let me recall from the previous lecture. So, you know, uh, so algebraic geometry is a study of the geometry of uh, the set of common zeros of a set of polynomials. So, what you do is that you take a commutative ring R and then you take uh, uh, the polynomial ring over that ring in n variables and you take a subset of polynomials and then you look at the zero set defined by that subset, it is a subset of the uh, n uh, it is a subset of the Cartesian product of R with itself n times consisting of all those n tuples which uh, uh, are zeros common zeros of every polynomial in this set S okay and then the problem was that uh, so then you associated to this set S uh, the zero set uh, uh, in this n dimensional space over R and uh, of course we want to ensure that this set is not this this set does not turn out to be the empty set. So, what we do is that we we assume that <coughs> uh, we always work over an algebraically closed field. So, we take R to be k uh, where k is an algebraically closed field and then our situation is like this we <coughs> on the commutative algebraic side we have the polynomial ring in n variables over k and uh, we take a subset of that ring which means we take a bunch of polynomials. Uh, which are the elements of this set capital S and then <coughs> you look at uh, the set of common zeros uh, in n dimensional space uh, over k and of course uh, uh, the important thing is that you should not worry about this as a vector space you should not think of it as a vector space you should think of this as an affine space and <coughs> which means uh, that you are not worried about the vector properties uh, uh, the addition properties and so on but you are worried about uh, uh, other properties uh, rather topological properties and these topological properties come from what is called the, <coughs> the Zariski topology okay. So, I have to tell you what the Zariski topology is. So, if you remember I told you that the Zariski topology uh, 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 is declared by declaring certain subsets as closed sets and these subsets are uh, the the uh, the loci the loci of zeros of a bunch of polynomials okay. So, let me so let me uh, uh, elaborate on that so what i'm going to do is uh, i'm going to do the following uh the zariski topology on kn uh, of course k algebraically closed field let me write it here Okay. So, define so definition a subset. Uh, uh, let me say um, f. Uh, or let, uh, let me not even give symbols. A subset of a n is called uh, uh, an algebraic set. if it is of the form z of s where s is a subset of the polynomial ring in n variables over k okay. So, uh, look at the definition what it says is an algebraic subset of uh, k n which is k cross k cross k n times the Cartesian product of k with itself n times uh, is nothing but the uh, locus of common zeros of a certain collection of polynomials a subset of polynomials in the polynomial ring with uh, the same number of variables as the number of copies of k you are starting with okay. Now, 
So immediately you have the following uh, uh, I am going to write down some properties and these properties will tell you that <coughs> you can always uh, declare uh, I mean because of those properties you can declare sets of this form as closed sets and that will give you the Zariski topology. So, so here so here is a here is a lemma uh, number 1 z of uh, uh, so the, the the whole space is z of I'll set do uh, <coughs> or rather mm, rather I should write z of 0 then I'll set is uh, z of uh, uh, well maybe I can take the whole ring uh, third one is uh, <coughs> z of s1 union and so on z of s n is z of s 1 dot 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 s n fourth one uh, intersection for alpha z of s alpha is z of union or alpha s alpha ok. So, so you see <coughs> this is the uh, these are 4 properties and let us uh, uh, let us try to prove them uh, yeah I will explain what this s1 etc sn means it is <coughs> it is the n fold n fold products ok. So, I will explain I will explain these statements one by one. So, well they are pretty easy to verify we will do that. So, you see uh, so the proof the first one is well what is what is z of 0 uh, it is all those points in kn which give 0 when you substitute them in the polynomial 0 but the polynomial 0 is a constant polynomial 0 it always has the value 0 no matter what you substitute in the polynomial therefore every point in kn satisfies this ok. So, one is 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 obvious ok and what you must understand here is that we are thinking of 0 as the 0 polynomial ok you are thinking of 0 as a 0 polynomial and the 0 polynomial is also when you substitute the variables in the polynomial the value of that polynomial is the value that you get is also 0 ok. So, you must distinguish between 0 as a polynomial and 0 as a value of the polynomial ok. So, the 0 polynomial lives here whereas the value 0 lives in k and your uh, uh, so you must understand these two things uh, distinct from each other ok. So, but in any case this is this is very obvious and look at the second question look at the second statement. Uh, if you take the subset s to be uh, well you know if you want to be very <coughs> particular maybe I can even put <coughs> I can put this because I write 0 of a subset. So, I should actually give you a set and if I just write 0 it is just a single element, but normally we have this abuse of notation that if you have single element you will just write for a single polynomial f here you do not write z of f within braces but you simply write z of f ok you avoid the braces. So, if you avoid the braces this becomes z of 0 that is what I wrote first, but to be very strict to begin with let me write as uh, let, let me write it properly like this ok. Now, look at the second statement second statement says that the 0 set of the whole ring is uh, is the empty set that is obvious because uh, in fact uh, any subset of the ring which contains 1 or for that matter any non const any constant non zero polynomial will never take the value 0 at any point ok. For example, you take the polynomial 1 think of 1 as a constant polynomial it always has the constant value 1. So, it is never going to get uh, take the value 0. So, there is no code there is not going to be a single point uh, in 
in the in the in this Cartesian product which if you substitute it is going to give you the value 0 because the value is always non zero and it is a constant therefore this set turns out to be empty okay and look at the third one so for the 2 2 is also obvious as for the third one I should explain what this S1 through Sn means so this S1 through Sn means uh, mind you all these SIs are subsets of the polynomial ring and in the polynomial ring you have a multiplication okay so S1 through Sn actually means uh, products one uh, you take products uh, consisting of n factors where the ith factor comes from SI so let me write that S1 Sn is actually the set of all F1 Fn such that Fi is in SI this is what it means okay you take uh, one member from each SI and then multiply them out okay and then you take the 0 set of that and my claim is that this and this are the same. So as usual uh, how do you check two sets are the same you take something here show it is there you take something there show it is here. So, so let us let us try to do this if if you if you have a point lambda 1 etcetera lambda n uh, oops I think I do not want this n to be the same as that n so let me change this to m because this could be any number of subsets but it has to be a finite number okay. So let me change it here as well if you take an n tuple which is in z of uh, si okay that what what it means is that uh, you take any polynomial in si and you plug in for the variables this n tuple then you get 0 and therefore any such product will also vanish so it is clear then clearly uh, this point is in z of s1 etcetera up to sn okay that is obvious because you know to get a 0 of uh, an element of this means you have to get a 0 of an element which is a product like this product of polynomials and for that it is enough just one or it is a 0 of just one of them so that when I plug in <coughs> this uh, this n tuple into each of these even if one of them vanishes then the product vanishes okay therefore what it tells you is that uh, z of si is always in z of s1 sm so this this tells me that z of s1 the union is in the the 0 set of the product okay this is obvious what is a li uh, uh, little not so obvious is the other way around but which is also very easy to do by you can prove it by contradiction conversely if lambda 1 etcetera lambda n is in z of s1 etcetera sm okay then you have to show that it is in it is in at least one of the uh, z of si for some i okay so how do you prove it you prove it by contradiction you assume it is uh, not there in any of the z of si if uh, lambda 1 lambda n does not belong to <coughs> z of si for every i okay then what does it mean that it means then for every i there exists a g i in S i such that g i of lambda 1 etcetera lambda n is not 0. The fact that a point is not in the 0 locus of a set of polynomials means that there is at least one polynomial in that uh, set for which this point is not a 0 that is if you evaluate that polynomial at this point you do not get 0 <coughs> okay. So for E and I can do this for every S i okay then if you take the product g1 etc up to gm this belongs to 
S1 etc up to X, a, Sm, but <coughs> uh, uh, you know G1 etc Gm of if I, if I evaluate it on lambda 1 etc lambda n is not 0 a contradiction. <coughs> So, what this will tell you is that this uh, n tuple has to belong to some z of S i ok. So, that will give you the inclusion of this into this and we are done ok. So, it is a pretty simple argument ok and well uh, then there is only the fourth one left which is pretty easy to <coughs> see and once we do that we we have this Arisky topology on a finite space. So, uh, for the fourth one uh, you take a point lambda 1 etc lambda n is in the uh, is in the intersection of over alpha z of s alpha. So, here of course you are assuming that uh, s sub alpha is a collection of subsets of the polynomial ring alpha is the index and of course alpha varies over some indexing set which I do not want to uh, be very explicit about is that is not what we we are not in so worried about that indexing set because <coughs> we do not want we do not we do there is no restriction on the indexing set it need not be finite it could be infinite ok. So, if there is a point in this that means you are saying that this point vanishes uh, in every polynomial in each of the s alphas. So, uh, it means that this polynomial will also vanish I mean uh, this point will also uh, uh, this point will also be a 0 for uh, 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 if I for the uh, set uh, of polynomials gotten by simply taking the union of all the s alphas right this is obvious what is the first what does the top line mean it means that you take any uh, uh, polynomial in any s alpha for any alpha and you plug in this evaluate it at this point that is plug in this for the variables then you get 0 but that is exactly what this means if you take all the polynomials in all the s alphas then uh, they all vanish at this point ok. So, this implies this and uh, the other way is also obvious if if you have a point here then certainly uh, that point is going to be a 0 of every polynomial in S alpha for every alpha. So, it is going to belong to each z s alpha and therefore, it is going to belong to the intersection therefore, it this is this is just obvious I mean provided you think about it for a, for some time it is just basic it is very simple logic ok. So, this is uh, this is quite clear ok it is just set theory. So, uh, so that is the uh, well that is the end of the proof it is a pretty simple exercise, but what is the the import of this lemma the import of this lemma is that uh, uh, you can declare subsets of uh, uh, k n of this form namely the algebraic subsets you can declare them to be closed sets. If you declare them to be closed sets the lemma says that the whole space is a closed set the empty set is a closed set the union of finitely many closed sets is again a closed set the intersection of an arbitrary collection of closed sets is again a closed set and these are exactly the axioms for the closed sets in a topology. So, the lemma tells you lemma above tell implies that uh, k n becomes a topological space if we def if we declare algebraic sets 
to be closed. Okay. And uh, so, so this means that uh, uh, <coughs> therefore the uh, the uh, uh, the Zariski topology as as it is defined here is defined by a closed sets and of course the open sets are the complements of closed sets always so so uh, so let me let me mention that this is a risky topology uh, this topology the topology this topology is called this is a risky topology Uh, and k n along with this topology is uh, denoted a and k and called affine n space over k. So, so you see, we we stripped off, <coughs> uh, we we stripped off the vector space structure, but then to make it into a different thing, we call the affine space. We added the Zariski topology, okay, and this is the affine in space over k, right? So, things are uh, uh, quite good if you look at this picture. There, there is the. Uh, so the space on this side has at least become a topological space. So uh, the moment it becomes a topological space, we can at least start thinking of continuous functions. Okay. Once you have a topological space, you can at least think of continuous functions. And of course, the first question that one would ask is: These are of course the polynomials are of course functions on this space, and then you would ask: Are they continuous? And the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, it's an exercise, but we will also see it in some other way later. So it will happen. Maybe uh, you want, if you want, you can try it out as an exercise. That uh, you take any polynomial here and think of it as a map from k n to k, evaluating every point uh, uh, on that polynomial will produce a element of k. So every polynomial becomes a function on this affine space, and then check that that function is actually continuous for the Zariski topology because. Uh, the source space is k n with the Zariski topology which is a n k and the target space is k which is a 1 k okay. So uh, fact or I will even I will put it as exercise but we will see this later in detail uh, any f <coughs> in k x 1 x n x n uh, uh, gives a continuous map from from a n k to a 1 k that is essentially enough it is essentially enough to check that the uh, it, it is it is essentially enough to check uh, that the inverse image of any point is a closed subset <laughs> okay but <coughs> but it is an exercise they uh, you will have to do some work you will have to do some work okay. So uh, so you see uh, see there is there is uh, there is some uh, 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 there is uh, you know there there is some cyclicity going on here <coughs> okay see you know in the uh, in the usual topology when we study suppose you study real valued functions or complex valued functions then the set of points where the function vanishes is a closed set of course I am only worried about continuous functions the set of points where a continuous function vanishes is a closed set right and uh, well. Uh, the reason for that is topological because a single point is uh, closed as a subset is a closed set and uh, the set of points where the function is uh, where the function 
uh, takes the value 0 is the inverse image of the singleton consisting of the point 0 and that is the inverse image of a continuous function under a continuous function of a closed set so it has to be closed okay. So a set of points where a continuous function takes a fixed value is always a closed set I mean 0 is a special value but it could be any other value and you we, we use that kind of intuition to def to define the closed sets here to be given by the loci the common loci of uh, you know uh, 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 where a bunch of functions vanish okay. But then you know uh, what this exercise tells us that it, vindic it vindicates our stand I mean it tells you that our original intuition is correct okay. If our original intuition to declare 0 sets 0 loci as closed sets is correct then our functions using which we declared these 0 sets as closed sets they should of course be continuous and the fact is yes okay so this is a this this is an exercise it's pretty easy to check but i'll come back to it later in in a, in a more uh, general form okay so uh, so the the point i wanted to make is uh, 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 the the next point I want to make is <coughs> again um, I think I will need the, this diagram again so I will uh, uh, so let me again draw the diagram I will keep needing the diagram again and again uh, so here is the uh, so let me uh, let me do that this is geometric side and this is a commutative algebraic side. So on the geometric side you have <coughs> a n a which is uh, which is actually k n plus Zariski topology all right and on the commutative algebraic side you have the polynomial ring in n variables the same n as this uh, affine space okay and what we did is well we started with the subset here and then <coughs> we associated to this an algebraic set which is a set of zeros and this is actually closed by definition our algebraic sets are the closed sets okay and how do you get more general closed sets you get more general closed sets by either taking arbitrary intersections of such closed sets or by taking <coughs> finite unions of such closed sets that gives you all the closed sets. Now well the the what I am now next going to worry about is this side of the picture <coughs> see on this side of the picture what we have is just a subset okay and uh, a, a subset of a uh, of a ring is not a very interesting object by itself okay uh, usually so the 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 way I am asking you to think is whenever you look at an object you try to think of sub objects in the suitable sense. So for example you know <coughs> if you are if you are thinking of groups then you should think of subgroups. okay uh, if you are thinking of uh, for example if you are thinking of vector spaces uh, the interesting subsets are subspaces okay. So the same way if you are thinking of subsets of a ring what are the interesting subsets the interesting subsets are uh, well one could be ideals the the other could be sub rings okay but there is no part there is no there is no point in taking a sub ring here the problem is if you take a sub ring then it contains one and the moment it contains one z of one will become empty because uh, uh, you know uh, uh, z of s will always become empty the moment s contains a unit because a unit is a constant polynomial non uh, it's a non zero constant polynomial which never vanishes <coughs> so if you if your subset s contains a unit which in this case is uh, 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 a non non uh, a non zero constant then the zero set is going to be empty so there's no point in taking a sub ring here so the fact is you don't want any you don't want any units to begin with because if you take units here this set is empty there's nothing to study so what are the other sub objects you can think of the ideals and you know an ideal is non trivial if and only if it contains if it does not contain a unit the moment the ideal contains a unit 
which is an invertible element in the ring then the ideal has to be the whole ring okay. So uh, what this tells you is that it is the interesting things here to look at from the competitive algebra point of view are the ideals okay but what we started out is just a subset now how do you go from the subset to the ideal there is always uh, uh, a philosophy for this whenever you have an object of certain type and you have a subset and you want a sub object what you do is you take the so called sub object generated by the subset okay. So if you have a group and you have a subset a subset of a group is not so interesting but you can always take the subgroup generated by the subset which is the smallest subgroup which contains that subset. Similarly if you have a, a ring and you have a subset if ideals are what you are interested in as sub objects and not sub rings then you can look at the ideal generated by the subset okay. So what you can do is you can replace you can think of replacing this set S by the ideal that is generated by S. So what we will do is let us do the following thing let us write uh, S uh, let me use the following notation I will put S with a round bracket and S with a round bracket means the ideal generated by S okay so, so this is this is the this is the ideal generated by S in uh, in the in this polynomial ring okay. Now what is this ideal generated by a subset in the polynomial ring uh, of course there are uh, two ways of describing it uh, one is this is also this is equal to the smallest ideal of ideal uh, containing S this is one definition okay and that is and what is the smallest ideal containing S uh, how will you define the smallest ideal containing S it should well it is uh, uh, it first of all it has to be an ideal which contains S and it should be smallest among these which means that if there is a any other ideal which contains S that should contain this as well which tells you that this is the intersection of all the ideals which contain S. So there is another way of stating this said theoretically this is the intersection of all ideals J uh, over J where J contains S okay and of course you know uh, 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 when you want a smallest sub object containing a subset this is what you always do you take the intersection of all the sub objects which contain that subset and usually in good situation the intersection of all these sub objects will again give a sub object okay. So if you take uh, the intersection of a family of ideals that is again an ideal the intersection of a family of subgroups is again a subgroup okay. So if you want a subset generated by a sub uh, by a genera a subgroup generated by a subset of a group all you have to do is simply take the intersection of all the subgroups which contain that subset. Similarly if you want the ideal generated by a, uh, a subset of a ring all you have to do is just take the intersection of all the ideals which contain that subset okay. So that is the smallest ideal containing S and there is another way of uh, writing it out the other way of writing it out is just take S linear uh, just take the ring linear combinations of finitely many elements of S just take that okay. So let me write that down this is equal to the set of uh, uh, R uh, so you know K X1 etc Xn linear combinations of finitely many many elements of S <coughs> that is what it is that this is the same as this is an exercise I mean if it is a it is a simple exercise which you should have come across in a first course in competitive algebra but if you have not done it it would not take you uh, probably more than a couple of minutes to do it and and of course <coughs> you know, what does this mean uh, this means that you know this is a set of all uh, the set of all uh, elements of the form sigma uh, f i g i i equal to 1 to L where uh, fi are in S 
and the g i are in uh, in the <coughs> in k x 1 etcetera x n this is so you are taking finitely many f i s from the set s and then you are multiplying them with coefficients which come from the ring and then you are taking a linear combination okay and you can check that this is the same as this and that this is the same as this that is a very simple exercise okay. So well the the fact is that uh, the, the picture here becomes better because this is an ideal and that is a nicer object than just a subset because on the left side you are looking at a competitive ring you better the interesting sub objects are ideals and uh, then of course the question is you take z of this <coughs> take uh, because that is after all it is an ideal there but an ideal is also a subset so you can look at the set of common zeros and the fact is that you do not get anything new you get the same thing that is the beautiful point the beautiful point is see if there is a point here then it is a common zero of every polynomial in s therefore if you take any combination like this it will also be, be a zero of that because every term contains a factor from s and there are only finitely many terms and every term looks like this. So something here is always here okay and because this is a subset of that okay something here is also here okay because you know when I take ring linear combinations I can set all the g i s to be whatever I want. So I could set all but one g i to be 0 and that one g i I can set it to be 1 okay then I will get that uh, uh, <laughs> a point here will be a 0 of each element of s. So this will also be there I mean that will also be here. So the Marlowe story is the same. So what is significance if significance is that instead of uh, looking at 0 sets of uh, a bunch of polynomials because a bunch of polynomials a subset of polynomials is very dis not so very attractive it is not so interesting from the <coughs> ring theoretic point of view if you look at the 0 set of an ideal of polynomials things look better because an ideal is something that is a ring theoretic object and passing from a bunch of polynomials to the ideal does not do you any harm because the 0 set is not affected okay. So, uh, so this tells you that uh, somehow you know now the story is uh, getting better <laughs> on this side we have closed subsets and on that side you just do not have subsets you have ideals okay. So you see slowly uh, uh, you are getting some kind of a correspondence here you have closed subsets which are the algebraic sets and <coughs> they are supposed to be 0 sets of uh, bunch of polynomials but you can as well take them to be 0 sets of ideals. So on this side you have ideals okay here you have subsets of here you have the closed subsets of affine space and there you have the ideals in the polynomial right. So you already have uh, uh, the picture on both sides becoming clear on one side you are studying ideals of the polynomial ring in n variables on the other side you are uh, studying the closed subsets of affine space okay. So this is how ideal theory enters into the picture okay but it does not enter without its share of uh, uh, apprehensions uh, and they are as follows see the fact is that uh, you know uh, the, the, the worry comes from uh, 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 from very simple uh, observation see even if my set S was a single element suppose I was just suppose S was a single element that means S is only one polynomial okay then z of s is just the 0 locus of that polynomial this is a set of points in where that polynomial vanishes okay. But if you take the ideal generated by that polynomial it is a principal ideal <coughs> it consists of all multiples of that polynomial and that ideal and the number of polynomials in that ideal is huge okay you have you have so many polynomials okay and this set is a huge set okay if k is infinite uh, uh <coughs> I mean for that matter even if k is finite but 
the the fact is that uh, since k is assumed to be an algebraically closed field uh, some field theory will tell you that it has to always be an infinite set okay an algebraically closed field cannot be a finite set okay. So the fact is that this even if s is a single polynomial this is an infinite set so it it seems to you as if you are looking at zeros of infinitely many polynomials okay now intuition will tell you that if you put too many equations if you have too many equations to solve then you may not get any solutions i mean for example uh, in linear algebra if you have an uh, if you are solving n uh, so many equations in uh, say n variables if there are more equations it is very likely that you do not get any solutions okay and so you can imagine that if I am uh, uh, if I change from one polynomial to say infinitely many polynomials I I might not get any solution so therefore uh, this set may turn out to be empty but that is not the case the case is uh, uh, the, the fact is, is because of the Hilbert null Stellensatz you know that because you know these two are the same and since null Stellensatz says that the zero set is uh, of a single non constant polynomial is uh, non empty such a thing is not going to happen but there is something more that is uh, happening and that is the following fact the fact is for that matter if you take not just a single time set if you take any set and take the ideal generated by that that ideal will be generated by only finitely many elements. So what it means is that you are actually always looking at the common zeros of only finitely many equations even if you start with infinitely many equations if at all you get uh, a 0 okay then which you will okay so long as the ideal generated by those uh, by that subset is not the whole ring then you are actually studying only the common zeros of finitely many polynomials so this is uh, so you know this uh, somehow uh, removes this apprehension that you know uh, uh, even though you may be trying to solve a large set of equations i mean you are trying to look trying to get common zeros of a infinite set of polynomials actually in principle you are uh, actually solving only finitely many polynomials i mean you are looking at zeros of uh, only finitely many polynomials and this fact follows from uh, the so called uh, Hilbert basis theorem or Emi Noether's theorem which is one of the fundamental theorems that you study when you study Noetherian rings in commutative algebra. So uh, let me recall that and, and write that down so uh, so to recall from commutative algebra. Uh, a ring uh, commutative with one is called no ethereum if every ideal uh, is finitely generated. A Noetherian ring is a ring in which every ideal is finitely generated. If R is Noetherian, then so is R x1, etc., etc. A polynomial ring in finitely many variables over a Noetherian ring is again a Noetherian ring, and this is this is uh, uh, this is the so called Hilbert basis theorem <coughs> or it is also called I mean more generally it is called Emi Noether's theorem <coughs> So this is a fact from commutative algebra so what this tells you is that this implies that if 
the z of s is non empty okay uh, then uh, uh, even if s is an infinite subset subset the ideal generated by s is f1 etc up to fm for some fi in uh, k x1 etc xn so so you know what i must remind you at this point is that if i take r equal to a field k then a field k is of course no ethereum because a field has you know the only ideals in a field are the zero ideal and the full ideal okay and the zero ideal is obviously finitely generated by the element zero and the whole field as an ideal is generated by one so both there are only two ideals they are finitely generated though therefore a field is always no ethereum and therefore a polynomial ring over a field is also no ethereum by this uh, by this fact therefore what it means is that this polynomial ring in n variables over a field uh, has every ideal finitely generated so if i start with a subset s of that no matter that subset is uh, probably even an infinite subset if i pass to the ideal generated by that subset because it's an ideal in this no ethereum ring it is finitely generated which means that it is the ideal generated by finitely many polynomials okay and so so th this implies that z of s which is z of becomes just z of f1 etc fm so the moral of the story is you know when we started defining algebraic sets we were looking at we were looking at common zeros of a uh, bunch of polynomials which could be even infinite but in principle finally we are only studying common zeros of finitely many polynomials and that's uh, that's very heartening okay so you so why is it why it is heartening is because if there are finitely many polynomials this is something that you can compute you can you can do some computation and you can expect that you know this is not going to be a computation that will never end and this is one of the reasons that a uh, lot of uh, algebraic geometry uh, is nowadays done on the computer okay so uh, you have some special software programs like macaulay and coco and uh, things like that which uh, allow you to do uh, uh, ring theoretic computations on the computer and you can do these computations so you will be doing computations on the complete commutative algebra side and from those computations you can get consequences which means something geometrically so you can try to prove geometrical statements by doing computations on this side and the fact that you can do com the re the reason why you can do computations is one of the reasons is this you are never dealing with an infinite bunch of equations <coughs> you are always dealing with only finitely many equations and in fact uh, you may ask uh, when i write here for some fi it seems as though that these this fi are very abstract th that you cannot catch them but that's not true uh, the in fact there is a if you look at a proof of the uh, hilbert basis theorem then the proof also can be refined to a constructive procedure where you can get all these finitely many polynomials you can really get them uh, and so you can do this on a computer okay i can really do this on a computer and that's uh, what helps me to do computations in commutative algebra which when translated to algebraic geometry give uh, nice results okay so uh, so the moral of the story is because of uh, hilbert's uh, basis theorem uh, this the closed sets you are looking at in affine space in the zariski topology are just zeros of finitely common zeros of finitely many polynomials so you are simply studying uh, finitely many polynomials okay so uh, so the moral of the story is that when you do algebraic geometry you are actually trying to look at the geometry of the set of common zeros of a bunch of polynomials and usually the bunch of polynomials is having coefficients in a in a certain commutative ring okay uh, even if you go to a general commutative ring but make sure that the commutative ring is no ethereum then the hilbert basis theorem will tell you that even algebraic geometry in that very broad sense you are only looking at finitely many equations so uh, uh, mind you hilbert basis theorem will work uh, if r is 
uh, any noise theory entering okay. So this tells you that uh, you will always be looking at only finitely many equations if you are working with coefficients from a noise theory entering okay that is uh, that is the importance of this that is the geometric significance okay and <coughs> the other important thing is of course you must not forget that uh, we are looking at uh, the case when the ring is an algebraically closed field because of Hilbert null and such which assures that you really uh, get uh, zeros this th that is it ensures that the the zero set is uh, is not the empty set provided this <coughs> this ideal generated by uh, uh, this collection is not uh, is not the whole ideal that means it does not contain a unit okay. So we will see more about that in the next lecture.